sing this with me. Oh, how he loves you and me. Say that again. Oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his life. He gave his life. What more could he give? Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves you and me. You know he does. He loves you so much that he died for you. We still have no anything, so open your Bibles. There's no shortcuts this morning to Mark chapter 1. Last week we talked about life before the journey that Jesus was going to take. And, and again, I want to reiterate that the journey to the cross didn't begin in the Gospels. It didn't begin in the Old Testament. It began before any of this, any of us, any of what we know as creation was actually created, that God had a purpose and a plan, and that purpose and plan was going to culminate in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, the Son of God. And with that reality comes the promise and the assurance of that when Jesus ascended back into heaven, that he is going to come again, and he's not going to come again as the suffering servant, but as the conquering king, having fulfilled all of the purposes, all of the promises of God, and he's going to come back to claim what is rightly his. But until that time, we get to celebrate what he did for us. We get to celebrate that he made it possible for us to have a relationship with him, for us not to, not to be condemned and eternally separated from our sin because of our being at odds with God. Jesus came to rectify that, to reconcile man to God, to bring man to the, to the precipice of, you can cross over this bridge to God by me, but you must. You must realize that I am God, that I paid a price, and the price I paid was the Son of God dying on a cruel, bloody cross for your salvation, and believe that I, I died a very physical death. I was put in a tomb, and I remained in that tomb for three days, and on that third day, I arose from the dead. I defeated death, I defeated Satan, and I completed the perfect plan of God. And when we believe that, then we're ushered into the family of God. And that's something to celebrate. So all, all together, we know this word, amen. Say amen. 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 Because without it, we might as well go hike in the monument this morning. Or go home and go back to bed because it was early at 4.30 this morning, which is usually 5.30. But, you know, we come to worship, we come to gather, you know, for Bible study at 845 to learn more about God, to learn more about Jesus, his purpose, his ways, his means of why he does what he does and who we can be in Jesus. And then we come and we sing praise songs and we worship, we sing hymns and praise songs. And then I, I preach and try to teach so that we'll have a deeper understanding of not only who God is, but the more we understand who God is, we begin to understand who we are. Because if we don't understand who we are, then we have a real tough time lining up with God. Because our identity is in Jesus. Our identity is not in our birth, not in our family, not in our blood. It's because God gave us new life spiritually, and we were born again. And if you're not, that's the only thing God wants from you, is he wants you to be his child. He wants you to admit that you're a sinner. He wants you to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that he died for you, and that he did all that I've already talked about, and that he offers you salvation. And so if you don't know Jesus, Jesus this morning, that's the beginning of new life. And you might say, well, Ray, I've done that, but I don't feel new. Well, Sometimes we don't feel the way we're supposed to feel. And this is what the Bible would say. Don't trust your feelings. But that's all I've got to go on. Then something's wrong in your spiritual life. And I want to address that this morning. 
Because if we're governed by our emotions and governed by our, our feelings as Christians, then we're not being led by the Holy Spirit of God who tempers all of that angst, all of that, that indecision, all of that fear. And that's not dealing with, with so many things that are chemical and all that. But God says, if you don't know which way is up, why don't you look up and I'll tell you and I'll show you. And some of you are thinking, Ray, that's very simple. And you're being simplistic. And yes, it is. And yes, I am. Because it is. Because when we live surrendered to God, based on what Jesus has done for us by the power of the Holy Spirit, we have hope to live a productive life today. Because we know eternity's coming. But he said you can do it today. So we're in Mark chapter 1. And the journey begins with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit doing what two parts of the Godhead. The Godhead is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Son has come down in the flesh, Jesus. And so the first thing that God does is he validates Jesus. He lets everybody know, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. So let me read it to you. In Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 9, at that time Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven saying, you are my son whom I love and with you I am well pleased. Both the Father and the Holy Spirit affirmed the purpose and the plan of God in Jesus, that he was and is the Son of God. And guys, we, we have to know that. Our hope is only found in Jesus being who Jesus said he was and who God said he was. That's our only hope for this life, but forget this life. It's our only hope for eternity. And so if we don't believe the, the very core of, of who Jesus is, after the Father says, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased, and the Spirit ascends on him like a dove. So it's affirming, it's validating that Jesus is that purpose, is that plan, is God. And he is the ultimate sacrifice. In verse 12 of Mark chapter 1, I, this is my son in whom who I'm well pleased, in verse 12. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with wild animals and angels attended to him. He was validated the moment he got out of that water. He went and he began to be validated and fought a battle with Satan by the power of the Holy Spirit as he was tempted, as he was hungry, as he was tired during a 40-day Assault, he was validated as being who he was. That was God's purpose. That was God's plan. Physically, he was on a hunger, hunger strike. Not intentionally, probably. He didn't eat for 40 days. So physically, he, he surrendered himself. Emotionally, he was alone. There were no apostles. There were no disciples at this point. Jesus was alone in the wilderness with God, the Father and God, the Holy Spirit, and Satan tempting him. And guess what? He won. That shouldn't be a shock to us. But you know, it was more than all that, it was a spiritual validation. It was a spiritual victory. He didn't give in to the temptation. And Scripture says he was tempted every way in which man is tempted. And Jesus didn't give in. And you're going, yeah, he's God. Yeah, he was, he's God. But he's also 100% you and I. Anybody not sin this morning? Keep your hands down and we're going to have a chat. <laughs> we all, because we all fall short of God's glory. Jesus didn't. Even when he was hungry, thirsty, and exhausted. So he was, he was validated at, at the baptism. He was validated as, as he began his first 
challenge, his first trial, if you will, out in the, out in the wilderness all by himself. You know, never by himself because he's kind of like us. The Holy Spirit was with him every step of the way, just like he is with us. In verse 39, I want to skip all the way to verse 39. Because as, as God validates his son, he validated him by being who he is, by what he's capable of doing, but through the power. And then there was something that Jesus was called to do that he allowed the apostles to do. And that was to be miraculous, to, to perform miracles. In verse 39, we see the previous scripture, uh, Jesus healed. That's big. Being able to heal someone, we got a lot of TV preachers that go, be, be healed, and that's all a sham. You know, that's not what Jesus did. When someone was healed by Jesus, he was healed. I mean, the lame got up and walked. The blind were able to see. Uh, the dead were risen and came to life. Jesus healed. He taught. But this is what Mark's gospel says in verse 39. And he went into their synagogues throughout all Galilee, teaching and casting out unclean spirits or demons. Jesus did something that no one could do. Heal and stay healed. Teach with knowledge about who God really is. And then the ultimate would be casting out those unclean spirits that ravaged that culture. Because they worshiped so many false, small g gods. And so by the time Jesus gets done with chapter 1 of Mark, he is firmly planted as God's Messiah. And he's validated for that. And, and then Jesus does something that is very Jewish, very Hebrewish if you will, he began to preach the same message as his forerunner, John the Baptist, preached. Let me read this, and I want to explain just a little bit. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 12, I'll give you a second to turn there. Matthew chapter 4, verse 12, or you can just listen, and I'll just read it to you. One more time, Matthew chapter 4, I'll have to use both hands, so it's verse 12, and verse 13. Now when Jesus heard that John had been taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea and in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. That's the message John the Baptist had. The difference is, is that the promised one, the one that Jesus was pre I'm sorry, that John the Baptist was preaching about was Jesus, and Jesus was preaching the same message. I'm here. The kingdom of God is at hand. The purpose, the plan, the end is coming. Your wait is over. The Father is going, to, going to, to fulfill all that the prophets had prophesied about. All, all of the Old Testament, all of the Old Covenant was going to be fulfilled in Jesus. Folks, that's awesome. That's cool, but that's part of God's plan. But if you have another, if you still have your Bible, John chapter 1, verse 29. Jesus didn't just come to do all that. He did come ultimately to be the sacrifice or the propitiation for our sin. That's the price that God demanded for not being able to be right with him because of sin in our life. So Jesus was the price. He was, he was the fulfillment. He was what God desired. God the Father demanded and so in John 1, 29, um, the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So by the, all, by the time all of this, and most of this came from, from the first chapters, other than a few ventures into chapter 4 of a very long lineage of Matthew and so forth, Jesus is who God said he was going to be. And he did, up to that point, exactly what he was supposed to do. And so now his ministry has actually been kicked off. 
and he's going to begin. He's been affirmed. He's been validated. He's been tested. He's been tried. And now he's going to do something else. He's going to begin to teach a different message than what they had ever heard before in the entire existence of humanity. Let me just read part of it. You know it. We went through it not too long ago. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who are gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied, and so on and so forth. He began to say, guess what? All that you know about life, all that your parents taught you about, you are the center of the universe, that all, all life revolves around us as being Hebrew, that life, all of life revolves around what I want and what you want. Guess what? That's never been the purpose and plan of God. Because blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And people were like, what on earth is this guy talking about? We've never heard such a thing. You know, we go, yeah, we've known that since we were kids. They had never heard that before. Never. And so Jesus came to teach them about what real life was all about. And that... That was the beginning of him vocally and, and visually shaping the world that he impacted and that he lived in. He began to teach about life and teach about death. And in John 10.10, 10, you don't have to turn. To, you know, I'm not going to ask you to turn anymore. I'm just going to read these to you. John 10.10, 10, he talks about the abundant life. And I know we always usually hit the last part of that verse, but let me read the whole thing, that the thief comes to steal and to kill and destroy. Jesus said, I came that you may have life and have it to the full or have it abundantly. See, there's that conflict of I didn't come to do anything but to bless you and everyone else wants to take from you. I've come so that you'll understand that there is a life to be lived that is fulfilling, rewarding, not just eternally, but in the here and now. And Jesus is telling them and going to tell them and going to teach them how to achieve that in him. And so then we begin to be introduced to the Motley Crew, and I'm not talking about the rock band. I'm talking about the apostles, the 12 apostles, and the many disciples. And we must remember that there is a, a distinction between a disciples and apostles. The apostles are, 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 are special. There were plenty of disciples. There were only 13 apostles. And Judas betrayed him, and so he was gone, and then another one was added. But Jesus begins to assemble around him a group of people, a group of men at this point, that were going to be his intimate, closest friends and learners. And he was going to teach them the ways of God. See, most of them were already pretty knowledgeable about the Old Testament. They knew about the sacrifices and the rituals and, and all that God had demanded. But Jesus was going to teach them that the blessed are the meek and those that hunger and thirst for righteousness. And he was going to teach Peter and Andrew and James and John and all of those men how to how to live life differently and then teach people how to do it too. And we're the recipients of that because we get to read Peter's letters. We get to read John and then the apostle Paul 
I guess there were 14. You know, there were 14, right? But Paul didn't walk with Jesus. Yeah, but he met him on the road to Damascus. See, Jesus calls out who he wants to call out for his purpose and for his plan. But at this point, Paul was not an apostle. He doesn't become an apostle until Acts chapter 9. Jesus is gone physically at that point. But Jesus has gathered around himself all of these guys. How did he figure out who, who he needed to, to bring? How, how did he know to walk down, this, down the shore in the, of the Sea of Galilee and call Peter and, 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 and James and John and, and go, you know, they're, they're fishermen by trade and they're, they're tending their nets and they're doing what f stinky fishermen do. And he says, follow me. And they listen. They give up all that they've ever known, all they ever worked for, because this guy walked down the shore and said, follow me. That's crazy. Right? See, we, we go, no, it's not, because they became, but yes, it is. But it's not. Because God's more powerful than what we think, what we know, what we believe, and what we understand. And if you don't think and we don't think that God had planned in advance, advance and prepared everybody for what was coming, then we just don't understand God clear enough. Because only God could do that with a guy like Peter. Because Peter knew everything. Just ask him. He would tell you. He knew about supersonic jets and they hadn't even been made yet. I kid. You didn't believe it, no. So he took... He took the common, the normal. But how did he choose them? I want to read something to you. In Luke chapter 6, again, you don't have to turn there. Again, Luke and, and Matthew are a little bit longer in their, their genealogy and in their, their storytelling. But in verse 6, in verse 12 of chapter 6, at this time, Jesus went off to the mountain to pray and he spent the whole night in prayer to God. And when he came down from that meeting with the Father on the mountain, he chose 12 disciples. And he began what we would know as his earthly ministry. Matter of fact, let me jump to that because he chose a circle of companions. And he chose them well. Let me just, Continue on with Luke chapter 6, verse 13. And when that day came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also named apostles. So you, again, you've got the disciples. All of those who were called into salvation are called, we're all called to be disciples. Surprised? Amen. <laughs> but he called the, everyone to be disciples, including the apostles, but he called the apostles to be apostle disciples. Make sense? Good. It should. So, um, actually, let, let me read them to you. Can I, can I give you their names? Let's see if we remember them all. I, I learned a song when I was like seven. And that's really the only way because my mind just thinks of everything in song and music. Weird, I know. And when day came, he called his disciples to him. Oh, and by the way, this is, let me just read it in context. It was at this time he went off to the mountain to pray, and he spent the whole night in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also named as apostles, Simon, who he also named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James, and John, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Those are the guys that he called out of all of those that, that began following him. The word apostle means the sent ones. And that's where these guys are going to go, to all different places. And then all of a sudden, Jesus' purpose and his itinerary became that of the apostles. 
Let me just finish reading that, that section of verse in, um, beginning in verse 17 of Luke chapter 6. Jesus came down with them and stood on a level place, and there was a large crowd of his disciples and a great throng of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the coastal region of Tyre and Sidon who had come to hear him and be healed of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits, they were being healed and cured. And all the people were trying to touch him, for power was coming from him and healing them all. So we get this picture of this great throng of people. And there's Jesus, and he's, he's surrounded or flanked by his disciples and the 12 apostles. And people are coming, and they have such great need. And Jesus is meeting every single one of those needs. And Peter's going, and I'm embellishing, wow, this is who I'm following. Look at what he's doing. And James is going, unbelievable. As person after person is healed of their affliction. And they would all be doing the same thing within weeks. Because their purpose was part of Jesus' purpose and plan to seek and to save that which is lost. For Jesus to walk to the cross. You see, Jesus, he didn't have to go. No one could have forced him to go. He chose to go. He chose to honor the will and the plan of God. But in their sovereignty, in the sovereignty of God, God says, and we know this because it's explained in Scripture, it's fleshed out in Scripture, that if Jesus came and he was the only one that healed and he was the only one that, that, that spoke of his coming, it wouldn't change the world. Because the purpose of God was for Jesus to ultimately be crucified, put in that tomb which we talked about and, and rise from the dead. But then he was only going to walk the earth for another 40 days. And I don't know if we recognize this or realize it. We have short memories. How many of you know who Andrew Jackson is? How many of you could, could, and please don't, but how many of you could tell me 12 things that he did and accomplished? A couple of you. What about Stalin? Trudeau? We forget. What about Nebuchadnezzar? Thank you, Elizabeth. She's going, yeah, I, I know. We have short memories. And so this is what God did. He said, you 12 disciples, apostles, and all of my disciples, when I'm gone, I'm going to bless you like you've never been blessed before. The Holy Spirit, who sat on me, who lit on me like a dove, who I operate through, under the authority and submission to the Father, he's coming for you. And you're going to have all the power to accomplish what you need to accomplish. But you won't be able to do that until I'm gone. So here's your message. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I command you, even to the ends of the earth. You are going to be my voice, Jesus said. You are going to take the repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand, and you're going to take it throughout the world because you're going to be my mouthpiece. So Jesus, at the end of this morning's sermon, has put everything in place to take the next step to the cross. He's put together his people. He's been affirmed. He's taught. He's healed. He's preached. And now he's ready. 
And so next week we're going to pick up right at the tail end of this and walk through some more until we get to Easter when we really get to celebrate the culmination of all that God had planned for us. But I'm going to ask if you'll stand with me this morning. See, I know, I know, I know some of you are afraid. I, okay, one thing I'm not, I didn't just fall off a turnip truck. Okay, I, 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 I'm, I'm not naive. I don't think most of us are naive. But fear of anything can destroy you. Okay? And if you're afraid of something this morning, whatever that fear might be, I'm asking you, and God desires for you, to take it to him. Because whatever you're fearing this morning, and I don't want to get specific, whatever you're fearing this morning, if you don't get a grip on it, it's going to hold you captive. And you will not be a disciple you will not be faithful, and you will not be walking with God the way that he wants. Because he's bigger and greater than our, our, our wildest fear. And there are things to be wary of and, and, and all that, but he says, fear not. And as Christians, we have the promise of living life abundantly. And so I challenge you this morning, whatever it is, you just lay it at the feet of Jesus. And this is not to minimize or belittle or, or, or anything. Just be faithful in being who Jesus saved you to be. Someone who submits to the authority of God and walks in the pattern of godliness. And we can't do that if we're governed by fear. It's not possible. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the journey of Jesus. I thank you for what he accomplished. God, and, and it's going to get ugly. And I think we all know that. And yet, Father, that was your plan. Your plan was to, to make it possible for us to, to be reconciled and made right with you. Right with you. And so, God, this morning as we sing this song, God, I pray that, that we would turn our eyes to you, that we would turn our hearts and submit ourselves to you, whether we're believers or not, especially as, as, as non-believers, that we surrender to you and do what we talked about earlier, asking Jesus to save us. But, Father, as those that have been Christians and, and followers of Jesus for so long, God, that we would renew our pact with you, that we would submit and confess that we would be faithful to the calling of being a Christian. Not letting any outside influence or any internal influence separate us from you and your purpose and your plan. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to sing a song, Just As I Am. Oh, that's an easy one. Is it done yet? We're going to sing.